Welcome to Bite Size Impressions, I'm Mike, and today I'm here to talk about something that's probably going to be seen as blasphemous by many of you. Not everyone, of course, there are certainly people on my side of the fence here, but I guess the best thing to do now that I've said that is just rip the band-aid off. A few years ago, I've made the really tough decision to stop buying physical copies of video games. For the most part, there is an exception to this rule, and I'll let you know what that exception is, plus why it's the exception in a little bit. But before I even dig into this, there's a couple of things that I want to say. One, physical media has always been a very important part of my life. Ever since I was young, I was getting physical copies of video games. I had a massive VHS collection, and uh, my film collection is still quite large. I have a Blu-ray and 4K disc collection right now that is 1,500 plus titles. Uh, I'm collecting music as records all the time. But when I'm collecting physical media, I need it to make sense. And for video games, I don't think it makes sense, at least for me, anymore. And secondly, I'm not here to be argumentative or combative or to get you to change your purchasing habits. Nothing like that. I'm just here to kind of explain why I decided to make the decision to go all digital. And if I can give you some things to think about, that's great. But if not, that's okay, because I think there are still plenty of reasons for people to continue buying physical media. There are plenty of valid arguments for video gaming. For gaming, you can buy a video game and then do what you want with it, essentially. If you want to let a friend borrow it, or you can do a swap so that you can let them borrow your game and you can borrow one of theirs that's great. Um, if you want to be able to trade video games with other people, that's another great reason. Some people just like to buy a game at launch at like a place like GameStop and then bring it back to GameStop when they beat the game within the first month so that they can get the most return value uh, in store credit to apply towards the next game. That way they never have to pay full price for a game again. So if any of those reasons are why you keep buying video games as physical copies, all the power to you, and I'm not really here to argue that. So the other side of the conversation that comes into play regards video game preservation. And a lot of people tell you, if you get a physical copy of a game, it doesn't matter if, you know, Sony or Microsoft or whoever shuts their servers down one day, you're still going to have the game on that disc, and therefore they can't take it away from you. My response to that usually is, what good is the game on the disc nowadays, at least in 2024? Because the way that video game development has changed ever since consoles are basically always online now, obviously things have changed quite a bit. They develop the game, they get to a point where the game goes gold, they give that data over to the disc pressing plant, they replicate these things like crazy, they go out to retail stores so that you can go and buy them on day one. But in between that period of the disc going gold and you picking that disc up at the store at day one, development is ongoing. And when you get that game home, finally, and you put it into your system, you're going to be prompted to update a day one patch. Now, that day one patch, it could be just a small little update that fixes little things, things that you might not even notice could be little minor performance enhancements. It could be, you know, uh, taking care of bugs that you never would have seen during your playthrough of the game. But day one patches aren't always so insignificant. Sometimes they are quite significant, making a game basically unplayable or at least not fun into something that is playable and fun. And that's where I kind of get hung up on this part of the conversation. I mean, can you imagine getting a Cyberpunk 2077 retail disc that was released at day one and then coming back to that many, many, many years later and being like, I got the game right here. It's preserved on the disc, but it's not. And that's the case with so, so, so many games these days and has been for many, many years. Cyberpunk was broken. It was buggy. It was practically unplayable depending on what platform you were on. So in the case of Cyberpunk, that experience is not tethered to a disc. It's tethered to the files that you're downloading online after you insert the disc into your machine. Another example that I always like to draw from is that Wolfenstein game that came out, I believe, around the same time as the first Watch Dogs game, which was, I think, 2014, 2015. Some people got their hands on that game a little bit early and they went online to warn everyone, don't play this game. It's boring as hell. The AI is practically non-existent and you're not going to have a good time with this. I don't know why they bothered if this was all the effort that they were going to put in the Wolfenstein. 
let this franchise rest. Then there was some conversation online about, hey, you should wait for a day one patch. And everyone was really skeptical. And they're like, yeah, right. The day one patch is not going to change the inherent issue that this game has and that it's the the enemy AI is just trash. Well, lo and behold, a day one patch comes out for the game. It completely overhauls the really base AI that was in the before retail launch version of the game, the version that's on the disc, mind you. And as we know to this day, that game was praised by both critics and gamers alike. But if you're stuck with a retail copy of Wolfenstein from that time and you put that disc in many years from now and you can't download updates for that game so you can play the intended experience, that disc is really nothing more than a coaster. And it's not always that nefarious, right? It's not as bad as Cyberpunk 2077 or that experience with Wolfenstein that I just shared. Sometimes it's more quality of life improvements that happen over the course of a game. And one such example of that is The Witcher 3. Yes, at the time of launch, that game was buggy. It did have some issues, but it wasn't broken. It was entirely playable. But over the course of time, they did a lot of quality of life improvements to that game to make it a much more enjoyable experience. And it's a much better game today as a result. And you're not going to get that just from playing a day one disc. So to recap, you buy a disc, you bring it home, you download data. Sometimes it's minor stuff, but a lot of the times these days you're downloading gigabytes upon gigabytes after you put that disc into your machine, just so you can get to playing the base day one version of the game. And if you have to download all this data anyway, just to be able to play the more enjoyable iteration of a game, why even have the disc in the first place? Why not just rely on downloading it from the online servers in general? Because take a look at the PlayStation 5. When that console came out, they had two iterations of that machine. They had a disc version and they had a disc list version. For $500, you could get the version that allowed you to play discs. But for $400, a hundred bucks less, you don't have the disc drive in there anymore. So you're saving some money. And I said to myself, why am I going to spend more money to put a disk drive into a machine if it's basically just using the disks as coasters and, and license checks anyway? My very first PS3 that I owned, I still remember to this day. I mean, it was kind of a big deal when it happened. I had that machine for probably a year and a half. This was very early on in the PS3 life cycle. And my Blu-ray drive and that thing just stopped working. I didn't use it just for video games. I used it for Blu-rays. That was my first Blu-ray player. Now on my PS3 at the time, once that happened, I was able to play anything that I downloaded off of their servers. But anything that required a disc, I was dead in the water. And at the time, it was not so easy or cheap to get a replacement Blu-ray drive for that machine. So adding all of this up, this is really why I don't really see that much of a push or an incentive for me to buy physical copies of video games anymore. The exception here is, as I mentioned before, is with Nintendo games. Nintendo games still come on a little cartridge, but more than that, when Nintendo releases a game for the Switch or whatever console they have at the time, they're pretty much known for quality. They have been doing more in the way of like day one updates or subsequent updates to their game after launch. But the games that they do this for, they're minor things like things to fix exploits so that you can't basically cheese your way through the games outside of what the developers intended for you to be able to do. There might be some minor bugs, but for the most part, you buy a game from Nintendo, you know that the game on the cartridge day one is going to be solid and playable so you, you can preserve that experience. And when it comes to games like that, I think, sure, buy a physical copy of a game. Why not? The game is there. It, it's not going to be changed substantially. I know we could probably point to some games like even Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom where, you know, lower resolution and everything like that. And maybe some performance issues where, you know, if you quote unquote, preserve a game in the sailing the high seas manner. If you know what I mean, you can play those games at 4k 60 frames per second, but that's not what we're really talking about here. We're talking about the retail experience, the games that you're going to buy literal physical copies of period. And not only that, but unlike Sony, unlike Microsoft, Nintendo has really, really been 
way behind when it comes to full integration with user accounts so that if you buy a game on one machine, you're going to be able to port that over and play that on the next machine. Nintendo's been terrible about that. I'm assuming that when the Switch 2 comes out, uh, allegedly later in 2024, that that's no longer going to be a problem. But like their whole solution for that has been unreliable and very clunky over the years. So I also don't really trust uh, Nintendo when it comes to buying things from them digitally. And I know there's still going to be people out there who are like, Mike, you're going to be beholden to the servers that these companies host for the rest of time, if that's what your line of thought is. Don't you understand what that means? And I absolutely do. But you're also beholden to the hardware. Is your Xbox Series X, is your PlayStation 5 going to last for decades upon decades upon decades? No, of course not. You're going to have to get a replacement machine or have your own machine repaired, and that's not going to come cheap. And as time goes on and on and on, collectors are going to drive the prices of that hardware up more and more and more. And by then, you should be able to play those games on other devices anyway. So that's really the thought process that brought me to the point where I just had to get out of the habit of buying physical copies of games. It just didn't make sense to, to me anymore, as I said. Now, I'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts and opinions are about physical copies of games versus virtual copies of games. Um, obviously, there's a lot of great arguments to be had and everything that you guys have to share, I'm sure is going to be valid, but I'd love to discuss it in the comments below. Uh, also, if you'd like to talk about this in other avenues, such as my Discord or on my Twitch when I'm live Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can find the links for that in the description below as well. And again, this is just my personal opinion that has informed and changed my own purchasing habits, and I'm not judging anyone out there. So let's keep the conversation civil, okay? I'll see you next time, everyone.